All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. It's truly a blessing to see each and every one of you and just want to welcome you out to our one way assembly Bible study every Wednesday night. And we so thankful that God has drawn each and every one of you because Jesus did say that he is the way meaning I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except he be drawn by him. And I'm so thankful that he has drawn each and every one of you tonight because many of us could be doing so many much more things on tonight. We could be at a movie. We could be eating out to dinner on a date. Well, we know the game just started as well for the Warriors, so... You could be doing many things, but I know many of you may still have it off to the side. That's all good. But the good thing is that you are here and God receives so much glory and praise from us. And we thank you so much for being here tonight. And as you know, we are dealing with a very interesting subject matter tonight and as well as a topic. Because, you know, we've been dealing with um, all the different movements, um, different beliefs and origins of different other uh, movements out there and um, tonight we will be looking at a very important one I guess you could say most of us may have family members friends co-workers associates and neighbors highly associated with this movement and it's okay because it's good to know what everyone believes and how we can know the truth and help anyone who does not know the truth and that's the good thing that we are here tonight for this particular class tonight that we'll be dealing with the Jehovah's Witnesses tonight. So that's what we'll be dealing with tonight. So make sure you have your Bible, pen, pencil, and pad if necessary. So what I'm going to do is provide us with a word of prayer and we'll be right into tonight's class. So let us pray. Dear Father God, we come before your presence this night, thanking you for all your many blessings. Dear Father, we thank you for awakening up us to another day, and we just thank you for your traveling grace, because many of us have been various places and destinations today, but we thank you for allowing us to arrive safe and sound back to our homes, to be prepared for tonight's class, and to be a prepared people for a prepared place. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for all of our sins, and we just ask that you will Come and sup with us tonight, and as we invite the Holy Spirit into our perspective places, wherever we are, whether we're in a car, home, a room, or park, Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word and study other movements just to see what they are doing and how we are so thankful that you have awakened our eyes to the truth. We will pray that others' truth will be revealed to them at due time. Father, we thank you so much. And we ask all these blessings in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So amen. It's good to see all of you tonight. And it's not easy rushing in and have to get stuff together. And sometimes I don't even get a chance to eat, but I'm just so thankful uh, to be here with each and every one of you tonight. So, um, as you're coming on in, it's good to see those who are with us tonight. And uh, to God be the glory for that. So as you know, we've been dealing with a subject matter regarding um, dealing with different movements out there. And there's a lot out there. And trust me, there's much more to come. But tonight we are dealing with the particular movement of the Jehovah's Witnesses tonight. As you know, it's laid out the same way week after week. We deal with the founder, who is the originator of the creator of the movement, then we'll look at the location where it began, then we will look at the date that the origins of this movement began, we're going to look at the key writings, because you know, as the Christian or the born again child of God, we only really have one book, but you're going to be amazed at all the other books and information and tracks and other writings that other um movements use. Uh, so really should be the word of God, but we understand they are, have different readings and writings. Then we're going to look at who is God to them. Then we're going to look at who they view of Jesus is and what's their view of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll look at what does the movement do to be saved? 
Um, what are they beliefs and practices after death? What they believe happens if one of those or one of they uh, passes on? What happens after death? And then we'll look at other beliefs and practices and perhaps rituals that they practice as well. So as you know, last week we touched on the Mormon and we had a very unique blessed time learning what they believe. And as you know, we all began this lesson a couple of weeks ago, what we believe as the Christian, the born again Christian, what we believe. Does anyone uh, remember who our founder is? Well, it's Jesus Christ, because I'm not sure what's taking so long, but it's all good. Uh, we should know Jesus. who our founder is. And um, that's very important. Uh, don't get me worried because we going over other movements tonight. But if you're not moved to speak on the move that you know who your founder is. You I'm have us all on mute. Oh, what it is, everyone has to unmute themselves. Because what happens is in the beginning, sometimes we'll come on with TVs and other little things going on in the background. So yeah, it's good if you can unmute for the following questions. So it's good to know that who is our founder again? Jesus. Jesus Christ. All right. Does anyone remember the location where um, Christianity began? Israel. Judean. Judean. Palestine. Perfect. That's good. Um, what was the key writings that we have? Holy Bible, Hebrews. Perfect. Greek, Perfect. New Testament. The Old Testament written in? Greek. The New, no, the New Testament was uh, in Greek and the Old Testament was Hebrew, Hebrew and Aramaic. Perfect. That's good. Excellent. Excellent. So I know we got a lot to cover tonight, but I thank you all for the uh, review right there. So what I'm going to do is if you want to mute yourself or I can handle it for you, because tonight we're going to get right into tonight's lesson regarding the Jehovah's Witnesses tonight. So stand by. I'm just going to make sure those of you who have um, Zoom, you'll be able to see my screen as I share it with you. So that's the good thing. But if you don't have um, a screen or Zoom out, I'll make sure I thoroughly um, explain everything to you as well as you can see it. All right, so everyone sees that blue screen, hopefully. All right, perfect. So as you know, this lesson is entitled Christianity, Movements, and other religions. But Marvin, you're not recording this yet, are you? Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I was about yeah, to, need to do that without um strapping my seatbelt in. Oh, <laughs> oh. Ooh, thank you. Sister. You're welcome. Holy, holy, holy. Let's Can't see. miss this one. Oh my goodness. I know that's right. So here we go. We was about to... Oh, that's what I needed to hear right there. Woo wee. Yes, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you again. All right. All right, so perfect. Y'all got that. Yeah, so much be going on. My mind running all over the place. So thank you so much. So we are recording, which is great. So it's good to see those with us on Facebook as well. So tonight's lesson is dealing with Christianity, even though we had our first lesson with Christianity, because it's important for us to know what we believe in in all these perspectives before we learn about anything else. And some of us probably do need to know a little bit more about Christianity because if that's what we believe in, we need to make sure we can defend the faith. The problem is most of us as Christians don't really know who Jesus is. We should. Some of us don't really know who God is. We need to know what the Holy Spirit does and what his movements and attributes are in our life. We need to know um, how to how how are we saved? I mean, if somebody walked up to you and said, "Can you help me be a Christian and be saved?" What would you what would you say to them? So it's important for us to know everything about what we believe in before we try to deal with something else. But that's why I'm going to slowly lead and guide you through each one of these movements so we can understand a little bit better who we are, what we believe in, and other movements out there, because there are so many other movements out here. Uh, did you not know there's a church that worships Beyonce? 
Yes, down in Atlanta, you go to this particular church. All you do is go in there. They play all of our songs, and you can basically smoke the devil's lettuce and weed in there. So this is what's happening. They got all kind of stuff out here. So it's important for you to know the truth. And yes, there is another church down in Atlanta. Um, I'm not going to call out the pastor's name, but I'll just say New Birth. Uh, the pastor there, he has a lot with all this land, and he's growing marijuana to help people learn how the young folk to grow. And he says he's teaching them agriculture. Whatever that is, I'm just sharing with you, just because somebody say they're a Christian, you need to understand there's a lot of stuff going on out there. Okay, so tonight we're going to be looking at this particular movement of the Jehovah's Witnesses, but John has something to let us know in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. John lets us know that, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Well, John is basically telling us that if you are a child of God, you can't believe every spirit that's out there. But the problem is, you have to test these spirits to see whether they are from God. But the problem is you can't test no spirit if you don't have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one that's trying and testing it, not you. So when we talk about, and he also says, because why? Mm -hmm. Why do we have to do this? Because many false prophets are going out into the world. So it's a lot of them out there that we have to be mindful how to handle this stuff. Okay? So with that said, that's what John reminds us in 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 then we have to wonder well because paul reminds us in the church of second corinthians chapter 11 verses 14 and 15 that paul says and no wonder for even satan disguises himself as an angel of light did you forget that the adversary the devil the serpent he was an angel of light before he was cast out of heaven he was one of the God's three uh, top generals. He was one of the anointed cherubim. It says in Ezekiel 28, starting at that 13th verse, that he was the one who walked up and down the holy mountain of God. So if Satan disguises himself as an angel, as an angel of light, well, what about these folk out here? Y'all remember David Koresh, Jim Jones? Well, they didn't look like no angel of light. And I don't know how the people in Waco or Waco, Texas got caught up into that because they said, he said he's Jesus Christ, but I don't remember Jesus wearing glasses. So then we got to remember the man, Jim Jones, started over in San Francisco. A lot of people, our family and friends, we know some people, some of our cousins and aunties went running over there to Jim Jones, took them way over there to Guyana tragedy, had them drinking great Kool-Aid, laced with cyanide. What is going on out here? How are people following this kind of stuff? But this is the stuff that's happening out here. And if you don't know your Bible, you will do it too. Don't get it twisted because some of y'all believe everything that come out of everybody's mouth and they ain't even in no religion. Y'all believe everything she say, everything he say, Ray Ray Nymph, Shakisha, whoever. Y'all be believing everything people say all the time. Better cut all that out. So these people ain't even got no religion and you believe in everything they say. And that's why Paul says, therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Yeah, everybody say they love Jesus, but it ain't the same one. Everybody say they love God. It's not the same one. When you look at the fine tooth or fine tooth comb and the fine print, you go find out a lot of this Jesus is not the one we worship. Some of them don't even believe who in Jesus at all. I mean, so let's see this. Paul says, therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. So that's what Paul tells the church at Corinth. And then Paul had something to say to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 26. And then Paul lets us know that this, he says, and the Lord's bond servant, must not be quarrelsome. That word quarrelsome means don't debate, don't argue, don't get into it with people of another movement or another religion. You listen, but Paul says, but be kind to all, able to teach, compose when wronged with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. 
you must be able to teach them something because you can't teach them something if you haven't been taught yourself. That's why it's important for us to be in Bible study Wednesday, Thursday, and church on Sunday because you need to know what's going on out here. And watch what happens as we progress through the night. You go find some very interesting things. And that's why he says, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses to escape the snare of the devil. That's important because they might need to know the truth and you might be the one that's go give it to them. You know them, but we have to quit running. When people come knocking at your door, don't run. That's why your curtain's black because your fingerprints all on the curtain watching people coming up, but you don't want to open your door. That's why your blinds all messed up and wrinkled because you keep going up there peekabooing, but you ain't opening up the door to let them know. You need to tell them the truth if you know the truth, but you can't tell them the truth if you don't know yourself. And that's why Paul lets them know having been held, held captive by him to do his will. So that's what Paul reminds Timothy in 2 Timothy. So guess what? It's time to get moving. So tonight, we're going to be looking at the Jehovah's Witnesses tonight. So with that said, it's very interesting that when we talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses, I often tell people, you don't have to debate or argue at all. All you need to work with is the founder of the movement. That's it. That's all. You don't have to worry about. You can bring your Bible, but you have to understand their Bible has been rewritten. Okay. And we know they go by the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. Why is the tracks? Because he very early started giving out tracks. When I needed to learn the word of God, I didn't need a track. I didn't need another book. All I needed was the Holy Spirit. He's the teacher revealer of the word of God because the letter, Paul says, killed it, but the spirit brings this book to life. That's why many people look at it. They don't understand it because you need God's spirit to read it and understand it. I know what that felt like in 92 on down because I would look at it and it was like, it didn't really comprehend. My mom would talk to me about it and I would read certain passages of scripture, but it wasn't sticking. But until I have the Holy Spirit in 1993, then the book came to existence to me. You got to try him for yourself. That's all I can say. See, a lot of us rely on a man or someone to tell us how the book works. Bible teaching and preaching is good, but you're going to have the spirit to read it and understand it. Amen. So when we talk about founders, there's the gentleman right there. His name is Charles Taze Russell. He was born in 1852. He passed away in 1916. Watch this. What I don't understand is this. If he was born in 1852, I always ask a person, of the Jehovah's Witness, I always ask them this one question. Before you received any information about this movement, what were you doing in the 1700s? See, these are questions that cut straight to the truth because you didn't hear about this until this was brought to your attention. You see, what I believe in dates way back when I look in Genesis, it's all there. See, I couldn't find a Jehovah's Witnesses around Abraham's time. I couldn't find a Jehovah's Witness around about Moses' time. I couldn't find a Jehovah's Witness around about David's time. But only until the 1800s, that's when we step on the scene. But I'm not going to keep it. I'm going to keep it real with you. See, I'm a witness for Jehovah. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness because I'm witnessing for him. See, I can't speak for him, but others try to, but especially if it began in this 1800s. See, look, watch this. Here we go. Then he hands it over to another gentleman by the name of Joseph F. Rutherford. 
oh, he was born in 1869 and he passed in 1942. I'm going to come back to some extra information here, but I just want you to be mindful when we talk about dates. That's why I told you in Christianity, our founder is Christ. And it says the date that our origins began was 30 to 33 AD. And that's when he went to Calvary. Isn't that something? But what's interesting, this wasn't just something that popped up in 33 AD or 30 AD when Jesus began his ministry. It dates all the way back. Understand the first prophecy of Jesus coming. It was in Genesis 3 and 15 and 16. You remember when it says, it shall bruise the head of the serpent? Well, it was Jesus coming to step on the wicked intentions of the mind brain of the head of the adversary. So this is not something I'm just working with in the 1800s. See, this is another problem we got. My founder wasn't born. He always existed too. Let me just add that in there too. See, it gets so good to me because just because he shows up as a baby in Bethlehem, that was because in John 1 and 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the Son of God. See, when it says, in the beginning was the Word, see, when there was no print, no trees, no ink, there was always a Word. In other words, before the beginning began, there was a Word. Then it says, and the Word was with God. Wait a minute. That sounds like the Word was with God. Yeah. Then it doesn't stop there saying the Word was with God. Then it says the Word was Him. So this is the problem we have to understand when people say, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. Those are three concepts. We have in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then we find out that the word was him. So how we got this confused? So when we look at the date of this movement, oh, it began in 1879 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. See, my founder uh, movement began in, uh, let's see, uh, 30 when he began his ministry and 33 AD when he went to Calvary. This is not over in the United States of America. And I understand we got the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Pittsburgh Steelers too, but we're not talking about the Pittsburgh right outside over here in Antioch either. We are talking about right here in Pennsylvania where this movement began. Then we got a location. There's a picture for you right there. His headquarters is in Brooklyn, New York where the Knicks are. Anyway, so let's keep it moving. So y'all got all that good stuff. We go keep it right along and move. So here we go. All right, key writings. What key writings do they use to learn? Well, they include what? The New World Translation of Holy Scriptures. New World Translation only, okay. And what else we got? You can live forever in paradise on earth. Well, from what I discovered, God only promised man three score 10 years on this planet earth, which was 70. Now, I don't know how you go live forever on this planet earth, but I do believe that, that God says when we cross over, we will live with him eternity. And if you're still here for the rapture, uh, it says you will have to deal with the seven year tribulation. If you're born again Christian, you will be caught up in the rapture, which is God's redemption program. See, this movement don't talk about the rapture. That's one problem we got there. And what else we got here going on? Let's see. Reasoning from the scriptures. Okay, we got a lot of good stuff coming here. Let's see what else we got. Oh, y'all familiar with this one because this one gets left in your mailbox on your porch if you, if you don't answer the door. See, they have to know where they leave the tracks to come back at you. But I wait and sit on my porch to see if somebody go come holler at your cousin. But nobody don't want to talk to me because I go straight to the founder. It don't take that long. Then we got the Watchtower magazine and we got this one. This is one I just grabbed. It says, does God care about you? You ain't got to ask me, do God care about me? I know he does. He woke me up this morning, started me on my way. And that's what's beautiful about this thing. See, these are all the key writings, but y'all remember when we did Christianity, we only had one book. We had an Old Testament and a New Testament. Now, it's good to get you a strong concordance so you can understand the Hebrew and Greek writings to understand the breakdown from the King James English to the English to understand the Hebrew and the Greek. You need to know that, okay? So let's see what else. Oh, there's the Awake magazine. We got a whole bunch of stuff up here on the screen. We got a lot. In other words, all this stuff supposed to help me? What happened to the Holy Spirit? 
Do we trust him? Do we believe in him? Oh, sit tight. You go see. So it says awake. The question is, are you awake? I know I am. Well, let's keep it moving. Who is God? Who, how do they view God? This is a good question. Well, let's see. They believe that God is one person. God called Jehovah, though. But what I understand is that God has many Jehovah titled names. When you when God wanted the children of Israel to move in request, he wanted them to call him by the name what they needed him to do. Just like today, if I need a healing, I call him Jehovah Rapha. Okay, then if I need some righteousness, we call him Jehovah to sit canoe. And if I need uh, the Lord is my shepherd, we call him Jehovah Rohi. Then if he's the Lord of hosts, his name is Jehovah Sabaoth. Then we have so many names that he goes by yes. because he can do many things. Yes. Just like I have many titles myself. I'm Marvin. I'm a father. I'm a brother. I'm an uncle. Then at my job, I have an occupation name too. Then some people might want to call you another name. We're not even going to deal with that, but only you know what you've been doing to be called out your name, and that's wrong. But we do know that God has various names. Oh, yes. you know, we forgot that the devil got many names too. Y'all forgot yes. that because the devil wants to be just like God himself. So why do we need to stick to one name? Right. And he does many things. That's He's true. the Lord thy God that can do anything and everything right. and all things. So why do I just need to call him this one? Yeah. This is the problem. We can't, he's, he, we're limiting him by just calling him Jehovah. He's Jehovah Jireh, he's Jehovah's Tzikadu. He has many names. So I'm not going to get caught up why I got to call him this because Allah means God too, right? So why is it that we got to strictly say this name? Why? Let me leave that alone. Oh, let's see what else. Oh my goodness, no Trinity. They don't believe in the triune Godhead. Wait a minute. Jesus came to save us. This is what's interesting. What? Oh, let's see. Jesus is the first thing. First thing Jehovah created. Oh, okay. Well, I've always understood that they always existed. I mean, when we talk about in Genesis, when God said, let us make man in our own image, God wasn't talking to himself. Most Bibles have a capital U, meaning you better put some respect on that situation when he says, let us make man. And I know my God ain't crazy. He was talking to his son and he was talking to the Holy Ghost. Okay, so we got to get this thing right. What do you mean no triune? We don't need to get caught up in it because most people don't know how to explain it and you don't need to. We just need to know that God expressed himself in three persons, okay? Yeah. Not three gods, because some people will say, why y'all worship three gods? No, those three are one. Just like there are three hands on a clock, the little hand says the hour, the long hand says the minute, and the little millisecond hand runs around dealing with all the seconds. But I know one thing, when I look at that clock, it'll tell me that it's 732 right now. So it's meaning three hands tell you one time. Right. And I'm not going to keep telling you over and over so many times that he is all and is all. Okay, well, let's see what else is going on. Who they view Jesus as? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is not God. Oh my goodness. You mean to tell me Jesus was able to tell the sea and rebuke it to be still? Oh my goodness. You mean to tell me Jesus fed many people who couldn't eat? In other words, people who were blind, people couldn't hear, people couldn't walk. Only God can do those things. And that's what they believed in the Old Testament. So Jesus is here. That's why the Pharisees and Sadducees got mad at him because he claimed he was God. So I don't want to say, is it, light from, is it lightweight Phariseeism going on here? But we can't say that because if it began in 1800s and the Pharisees go way further back than that. Right. And a lot of people didn't realize the Pharisees and the Sadducees showed up between the Old and New Testament, which was called the 400 silent years. Might have to deal with a class on that one later. That's when these Pharisees and Sadducees showed up during between the Old and New Testament. Okay, yeah. so what else is going on here? Before he lived on earth, this is what they said. What 
he was Michael, the archangel. So you're telling me Jesus was Michael, the archangel. No, the archangel is a little lower in position than Jesus. Yes. Understand? So we can't get that twisted because God had three generals, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer before yes. he fell. Yes. So why are you saying that Jesus is Michael before he lived on earth? Wait a minute. Either you go be on earth and go to heaven. Is that what you're saying? He was Michael before he lived on earth. The archangel, this is, twi I can't do it. I can't. What else? Jehovah made the universe through him. Well, why? Any, listen, Jesus was God's son. Understand? Because the last week we found out that that movement said God had a wife and copulated intercourse with God and the mother to get Jesus here. See, we thought this was something tonight. We got other movements believing stuff like God had a mother, a wife. What? God is a spirit. So this is the stuff that we have to know the truth because this is what's interesting. You got to look through this stuff. Listen. Oh, what else? On earth, he was a man who lived a perfect life. Well, for those 33 years, of course he did, but we must understand that was God in the flesh. Understand? Wow. Oh, let's keep it moving. What else we got here? Okay. After dying on a stake, not a cross, he was resurrected as a spirit. Well, you have to remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with all power in heaven and in earth. And he had to go before the father to sprinkle the mercy seat because there was an ark of the covenant up there because he had to atone for all of our sins. He became our high priest while he was here, but he had to move in the position in heaven to atone for our sin. And he became our substitutionary lamb of God. This is what he had to do. Why do you think Mary mistaken him as the gardener? after he rose. In other words, he didn't look the same, but he had certain characteristics because they beat him, they disfigured him, they pulled his beard, and Mary didn't recognize him, and basically the disciples didn't either. When he walked on water out there, they tell him to put the net on the right-hand side, not the left side, because they was all out there all night trying to catch fish. But let me tell you something. Those two went to the tomb and went in that tomb and saw it was empty. And Paul, John, and Peter went back to doing what they were doing. They should have started shouting that the tomb was empty. But they went back to doing what they was doing. And that's what people are doing today. They going back to doing what they're doing because they don't recognize him. You better know who he is. He got up with all power in heaven and earth. And my father did not die on a stake. He died on a cross, understand? Oh, wait a minute. See, I'm gonna get to some other stuff in a hot second. They believe he is not coming again because he already returned invisibly in 1914 in spirit. Wait a minute. They said Jesus came back in 1914. I'm gonna work with that a little later. Then they also, well, he, he predicted before this. They said in 1874. See, when you're dealing with a movement that tries to predict the return of Christ, you're going to run into a lot of problems. And that's what Charles T. Rutherford was trying to do. He kept trying to predict when he was coming back, but I can't trust that. How am I going to believe another? This is another thing. How can I believe in something that just got here one century, uh, century before I got here? I showed up in the 1900s. This movement began in the 1800s. Sometimes we got to ask ourselves truthfully. We don't even need to really deal with doctrine or founder. This movement began in the 1800s. And the person has to say, was this movement here in the 1700s? Was it here in the 1600s? 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 12. Not, it gets very interesting because 
the movement began in 1879, my people. Okay. What else is going on? Oh, very soon, he and the angels will destroy all non-Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, I'm still here. So I'm going to be waiting too. So when we deal with the Holy Spirit, this is their belief of the Holy Spirit, that the impersonal Holy Spirit is not God. Of course, you would think that because you don't believe in the Trinity or the triune Godhead. What else is next? Instead, the Holy Spirit is an invisible active force from Jehovah. Okay. All right. Moving right along. Okay. Now, this is the part here that's very important. Any movement has to work and figure out what you have to do to be saved, right? We believe we are saved by the grace of God, right? By faith. In other words, we don't have to work at being saved. We have to believe the finished work that Jesus Christ did at Calvary. And we must believe it and trust in the faith. And God gives us grace because grace works downward. It's like a two-way street. Grace works downward because wherever sin is, grace abounds. And then that good old combo, y'all say, when y'all know a lot of y'all, when y'all go to the um, fast food, y'all say, give me a number one or give me a number two. Well, I'm glad God got a number two for me. And it's called grace and mercy. See, grace works downward to deal with me, my sin and what I'm caught up in. But then mercy works towards up. That mercy is up. What is mercy? I always explain it like this. We all supposed to be destroyed. Right. Why? Because we we're born in sin. We don't deserve nothing goodness of God anyway. But they say grace is getting what you don't deserve, what you don't deserve. And mercy, watch this. This is different. Mercy is not what you deserve. And when we understand we don't deserve either one of these, but God's wrath is supposed to come down and get rid of us. But God's wrath is held back. See, this hand represents mercy. See, mercy holds God's wrath back from smashing the earth and everything in it. So we got mercy working up and we got grace working down on us. See, that's how this thing works. So when we say how we say, we say by the grace of God, but let's see how they are saved. Or what they believe. Oh, you must be baptized as a Jehovah's Witness. I, okay, you must do that. And the second thing is, oh, I have to do something to earn my salvation? In other words, I must, and most followers must earn everlasting life on earth by door to door witnessing and work. And that's what I do see and I enjoy seeing them out there. We need to be out there as well. But if my salvation depends upon this, that's why I'm out there, rain, sleet, snow, or shine. I get it. But a lot of us can do the witnessing on the phone. We can witness on texting. We can witness through email. You can witness at your job. Well, some of us don't even want to witness on Facebook because most of us got other junk up right. there. You got all this foolishness, all this other stuff up there. And I keep telling you, social media, your Facebook page ain't really nothing but a flea market. And it's basically trying to find out what you selling, what you got. And then come to find out, that's all you got. What is a flea market? It's secondhand good. So you mean to tell me what you putting out there is basically secondhand what you think you doing. But, oh, we want to show something else out there. We want to put the filter on, knowing good and well, you're darker, then you want to be lighter, then some people are lighter, they want to be darker, they want to get all this. I didn't know Facebook had Mac makeup. I didn't know they even had it, but these filters is doing a good job because mm -hmm. I ran into a partner of mine. He was a little dark, but I didn't recognize him in Lucky. So I'm going to leave that alone. We have to be out here getting the truth out at all times because... 
you need to tell somebody, and I'm so glad somebody prayed for me. Amen. That's what this is about. We must go out here and tell the truth, help others. And a lot of us ain't started witnessing our own home, more or less going out. You need to start down the hallway where your son at. You need to start down upstairs, downstairs, down the hallway where your sons and daughters. This is amazing. We can't tell nobody about Jesus in our own house. So I do give them credit. They knocking on the door, but we got to quit running from the door. We open the door for him. We open the door for her. We open the door for this. We open the door for Amazon, UPS, and everybody else. But we can't open the door to tell somebody about Jesus. All right. Oh, and you paid for whatever you bought on Amazon. But the problem is, this is free. You saving somebody, helping somebody life be saved. It's a matter of life and death out here. I'm so glad he opened the doors and opened my eyes because I was out there, didn't know what was going on. But oh yeah, and oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I got to stop the press on this one. They believe salvation in heaven is limited to 144,000 people. Well, they are called the anointed ones. And I don't mean to go this far because it says, I do believe if the movement began in 1879, this number has already been reached and passed since 1895. I just threw a number out there, which is, in other words, a little bit further than 1879. I'm assuming by 1895, you passed the 144,000. But this teaching comes from, they have to understand, the book of Revelation talks about there was 12,000 tribes, right? There are 12 tribes. Each tribe has 12,000 in it. And if you come up with the uh, addition and multiplication, you'll find that 12,000 times 12,000 is 144,000. And I do believe book of Revelation chapter seven, it actually tells you the names of the tribe. So I don't want to get anybody in trouble. The next time somebody want to tell you they're part of this one, uh, 144,000, ask them which tribe they came from then. Yeah, okay, since you want to claim the 144,000, what tribe are you from? Or what set you claim? See, this is the thing. You cannot just say this movement only has 144,000 people go be saved. Do you know how many people have been on this planet since 1879? Right. What? Come on now. But I think they stopped doing this because this went a little, I don't know, but I'm just saying, you can't teach this that salvation is limited to 144,000 people, that means I need to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm not in that number. Uh Uh-uh. What else we got going on here? Okay. What happens after death? In other words, now we're going to get into the area, what do they believe after a person passes away? Well, Paul told me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what was I believe, because if I'm born again, I don't have to worry about anything. See, it's called the two-in-one factor. If you are born twice, you only die once. And if you're born once, you got to die twice. What are you talking about? Because we all are born a birth date. We're all born here, right? That's the first birth. But you must be born again. Jesus had this yeah. conversation with Nicodemus. He sure did in John 3 and 3. Jesus basically letting um, Nicodemus, who was one of the Sanhedrin council, know that you must be born again, sir. Nicodemus say, hey, do I need to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? No, Jesus said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. What do you mean the water? Well, the water is the word of God and the spirit is the Holy Spirit because just as much as you arrived because there was a water bag that broke for you, didn't it? Didn't, Didn't you get here? You arrive through the womb of a woman because the water bag broke. That's the natural birth. Then you receive the natural spirit because Zechariah 12 and 1 says there's a spirit that God is formed within man. That's the first spirit because nobody's born with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Adam and Eve messed up. And I'm so glad we all part of the Adams family. Y'all might get that tomorrow because we all came from Adam. So we all part of the Adams family. I don't know about festing them and none of that, but I know I'm a product of Adam, but I'm so glad I know the second Adam. That's what Paul talked about, that second Adam in Romans. Understand? See, you must understand where you come from and where you're going, because if you're born once, 
This is the problem, my friend. If you're not born again, you're going to die. And guess what happens? You must, the, the soul got to die now. That's called the second death. Y'all follow me? So that's why you must be born again, because the first birth gave you entry to this environment. You became a human being, a citizen of the planet Earth. And the only way you could come through here, if you don't, is you're unidentified. You must come through the womb of a woman. And then to get where God is, you must be born again. That means you're born from up above because the first birth, you're born below and the second birth, you're born from above. Amen. So that's why a child of God, if they know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, you bat your eye on this top side for the last time, you will in two seconds work up, wake up in his presence. Hallelujah. And let me share something with you. You got to really grab the fact that, let me explain something. Let me just rewind and take for a minute. You see, let me give you an analogy or call it an earthly parable with the uh, heavenly example with a heavenly meaning, earthly example with heavenly meaning. You see, that car you drive, I don't care if it's a 2023, uh, old school, 1962 Cutlass mm -hmm. or 1979 Brown, whatever, you take that battery out that car, it's not working. That's the same thing with your body. Just as people see you, whether you large, small, short, whatever, with the filter or whatever, when you bat your eye on this side for the last time, your soul must be saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if it is not, that soul, that battery goes to the lower parts of the earth. And if you've been redeemed, see, I don't want to get too technical. God is so good when you're born, you're a battery with two negative posts. Let me share something with you. See, you don't realize you are still, God gave you life and you got two negative posts, yes. but the Holy Spirit is that positive post, but that negative post is still here because that's your old nature. That's the old you. But I know a lot of times people want to put you on timeout. They want to try to cuss you out. They want to tell you to do this and that and get the rough side of the mountain to come up out of you, but don't understand. Don't let the smooth taste for you because you got people that want to test you, try you, Come at you and they say, oh, I thought you were saved because you did this or that. No, 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 no. See, I don't, don't see, don't take my meekness for weakness. See, don't, that's the problem with a lot of people. They just think just because you saved, you won't do something. Well, that's how the Holy Spirit has to work on you to get you to grow in his grace, grow in his faith and grow in his word so you can handle and think first before you move. And see, a lot of us like to react. See, there's a difference between an actor and a reactor. See, the Holy Spirit lets you give this ability where you won't react, but you would act on the Holy Spirit to tell you how to handle it. Yeah. Woo, let me leave y'all alone because I'm trying to get right into what happens after death. I just want to touch on that to let, to let us know when you are born again, you have access to the kingdom and you don't need to worry about nothing. And the problem is when people are not saved, we want to say, oh, they accepted Christ when they was young, but we don't really know. Then you got people lying at the eulogy. You need to know that yes. you know that you know. Yes. Don't get this thing twisted. We cannot tell the truth if we don't know the truth. Your yes. fruit of your life displays how you lived. That's what this is about. Anyway, here we go. Oh, what happens after death? Oh, back to the 144,000 anointed ones live as spirits in heaven. Okay, but if it's 144,000, where do we fit in if you pass the number in 1879? Okay, what else we got here? The rest of the righteous, which is called the great crowd, live on earth and must obey God perfectly for 1,000 years or be annihilated? You mean to tell me we jump into the 1,000 millennium? This is way in Revelation chapter 20. I mean, it's like, how do we teach some of this stuff? But the Bible shows different. I can't get this information from someone else. I need to know the truth. And if I'm looking at other literature, I need to look at the word of God because the word of God doesn't tell me that I got to get my act together way at the millennium. This is Revelation chapter 20. People need to understand what is a millennium. I'm glad you asked. Do you realize all this time that God has put life into existence? 
the Bible does say one day in the eyesight of God is a thousand years, isn't it? Well, guess what? 1,000 went through already, and we're in the year of 2,000, so that's not that long. It's kind of like two hours in God's eyesight, but it seems so long to us. So his son is coming back, and when his son came, he came to set up the plan of salvation, meaning God wanted his son to rule and super rule as he told Adam when he gave him full dominion over the earth, but Adam messed up and it was taken away by the adversary. And that's when Jesus came at Calvary to take it, take the back, take it back. And that's why Jesus received the, the, uh, the deed to life, which was found over in Revelation chapter four and chapter five. We find that a deed to the earth, Jesus got it back from the father. Oh, that's some good stuff. You need to go read the book of Revelation chapter four and chapter five. Jesus got the deed of the earth back. So at this point, God is saying, my son, I'm going to finally set it up where you can rule from Jerusalem, but I'm going to let you do it in the millennium yeah. because he didn't do it when he was here. He was only here 33 years. So he's going to come back and do it in the millennium. And when you look at the word millennium is two words. You have Miller deals with thousands yeah. and millennium is annual millennial anniversary. So that's when his son is going to rule right there from Jerusalem. And when he comes back, he's going to bust the eastern gate down, the yeah. western wall where they stand. When you look on TV, yeah. they at that wall. Yeah. They, Jesus is going to come right through there. They tried to put the, the grave right outside because in the law, it says a priest cannot move through the grave. Uh -huh. But, oh, he's coming through. He's going to bust yes. it down and come right on in there as it was already prophesied. Yeah. So we have to understand this thousand year thousand years will be annihilated that is not what this is talking about but that's what they say it's all good oh let's move into the other beliefs and practices okay well we know that they meet in kingdom halls instead of churches very beautiful buildings i must say then we understand that the active members are encouraged to distribute literature door to door, which we understand that too. Now, you remember Jesus said to do this often in remembrance of me to show forth my death and sufferings till I come again. Didn't he say that? Well, they have their communion. It's called the Lord's evening meal for them. It's observed once a year. Members observe the Lord's evening meal like communion. Only the anointed ones may actually take part in this. So that's very interesting that it's done once a year, but most churches do it once a month. So that's 12 times a month, but we at One Way Assembly, we do it every Thursday and Sunday because Jesus said, do it often. Because when you recognize the Lord's Supper, you're basically reassembling the symbolism of what he did at Calvary. So why wouldn't I want to recognize that all the time? You can do communion tonight if you want to, every day if you like. That's what he said, do this often. But once a year, I don't know, but it's okay. That's what they do. I'm just showing you. Oh, what other stuff? Members are not allowed to what? First one, observe holidays or birthdays. And this is the part that is always very interesting to me because I know a lot of them work and there are certain holidays that you get paid for. My question is, are you going to turn that money back in or are you going to keep it in your pocket? So we got to understand if you're going to observe these holidays, how do you work your direct deposit? You going to tell them to hold up on this one? Oh, I, I mean, how does that work? You can't observe the holiday and you say you're not going to observe it. Then we got the birthday. Now, this is always interesting because you were celebrating your birthdays before you started this, but now all of a sudden you don't want to do it, then you don't want to celebrate other people's birthdays. We not, hey, this is very interesting because let me share something with y'all. You mean to tell me God blesses me with one mother. You only get one. You only get one father. And you mean to tell me 
I am told not to recognize the woman who brought me here, that I got here, and the seed from my thought, hey, you better get your act together. I know what I'm talking about. You only get one of those. People got many. One, you get more than one car. You got more than one house. You got more than one clothes. You only get one mother. And oh, Lord, how mercy. Let me leave that alone. We got to understand what we're doing here. Oh, you can't vote. So we know um, no presidential and no measures in, uh, okay, anyway, no voting for them. Okay. What else we got? No saluting to the flag. Well, it was always said, I don't know if this still does this, but they say if you got a flag outside your house, they'll keep going. So I don't want nobody going to Home Depot buying flags. You stand there and tell the truth, okay? All right. No working in the military. Okay, I'm just showing you other beliefs and practices. What else we have? Will not accept blood transfusion. So you mean to tell me if you needed some blood from your parent or sibling, you rather it, and, um, don't accept it and cross over. That's some faith there. Got to make sure you're going. That's serious right there. Oh, and then members believe Armageddon will occur soon. Well, if that's Revelation chapter 19, I'm not going to be here for that, though. So I don't need to, you know, I believe the Battle of Armageddon will happen, but I won't be here for it. Okay? Okay, y'all, listen. In most cases, Peter reminds us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, you, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard lest, listen, you get caught up being carried away by the era of unprincipled men and you fall from your own steadfastness. This is saying that you need to know your truth before you get caught up and may follow something else. And truth be told, many left other churches other denominations to go follow this movement. And it's up, it's basically is to each its own, but Peter reminds us to, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. That's what Peter wanted to always remind us. And then we have to understand that May God bless you and keep you in his care. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. And Amen. guess what? Next week, we will be looking at what? The Church, Church of Scientology. So if you're familiar with this movement, we're going to go through the same order. Who the founder is, the location, the date, all of that. We're going to look into all of those things regarding that. And um, in most cases, you got to realize that there are several information that we went through tonight that I'm going to make sure that each and every one of you gets this actual slide handout uh, that I went over tonight. And I just wanted to just touch on some things at the close. We just, it's just at 802. I got a couple more minutes. See, we got to understand that Russell's scriptorial interpretation differed from those of Catholics and many Protestants in the following eras. This is where he went a little different. When we talk about hell, Russell said there was a heavenly resurrection of 144,000 righteous, as well as the great multitude, that's what he calls it, but believed that the remainder of mankind slept in death, in death awaiting an earthly resurrection rather than suffering in a literal hell. And when we talk about the Trinity, well, Russell believed in the divinity of Christ, but he differed from orthodoxy by teaching that Jesus had received that divinity, watch this, as a gift from the Father after dying on the cross. 
That's not true. He also taught that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but the manifestation of God's power. And these are some, just sharing with you some other things that he went a little different in terms of Christ's second coming. Listen carefully what I'm about to tell you. Russell believed that Christ had returned invisibly October 1874 and that he had been ruling from heaven since that date. He also believed it's called the time of trouble began, then would mark a gradual deterioration of civilized society leading up to the end of the Gentile times with a climatic multinational attack on the restored Israel, worldwide anarchy, and then the sudden destruction of world governments. Listen, in October 1914, what's this thing about October about? We got two dates. We got 1874 and October 1914. Listen, after the outbreak of World War I, in July 1914, Russell reinterpreted that it was 1914 as the beginning of Armageddon. What? The Battle of Armageddon has not happened, y'all. This is what we got to understand. I can't accept something like this. Then this is the thing. I hope most of them know these teachings here. If you know this, you need to ask some questions. Did y'all know Russell believed that the Great Pyramids of Giza was built by the Hebrews under God's direction, but to be understood only in the modern era? Man, it's some stuff out here. We have to, it, it's really interesting, a lot of this information. This is called pyramidology, that they deal with that. Then Christian Zionism. In other words, there was another gentleman that he sat under, named Nelson Barbar. Russell taught as early as 1879 that God's favor had been restored to the Jews as a result of a prophetic double, which ended in 1878. We got too much 1800s going on around here. In other words, favor from Jacob to Jesus, then disfavor from Jesus until 1878. We got some stuff. I'm just going over some couple of little things. Well, let's talk a little bit about the early childhood. Well, as a young man, Russell was particularly troubled by what he saw as it's called irreconcilable inconsistencies in Christian doctrine. Well, the only time I hear about the word irreconcilable difference is usually in Martinez dealing with a divorce case. I did not know it was happening with the Christianity doctrine. I didn't know nothing about that. On the other hand, God was said to be merciful. But on the other hand, the souls of the wicked were said to be destined to eternity of damnation in hell. How, and he basically said, how could a merciful God punish someone for eternity? These thoughts led Russell to abandon his native Presbyterianism. So Charles T. Russell was a Presbyterian first. Oh, wait a minute. There's something else good here. It was only his encounter with the Millerites. Millerites? Don't think this is nothing dealing with Miller. No, it ain't done. This is the Millerites. And their claim that people could come to know God's plan by studying the Bible that enabled a return to faith. Who are the Millerites? I'm glad you asked. The Millerites were the followers of the teachings of William Miller. So I did not know you can name a movement after your last name because I'm not gonna go make up some called the Saucerites. I can't do that. So we got the Millerites from M William Miller who in, eight, listen, 1831, I'm telling you the truth. In 1831, first shared publicly his belief that the second advent of Jesus Christ and the Millerites righteously believed that they had interpreted the Bible accurately. They convinced Millerism was the only path to salvation. You think I'm going to follow somebody that's a Millerite? They thought that anything opposed to it was sinful. I'm trying to help somebody tonight. This is a lot of stuff. I don't want to go too far into this, but I gave you enough tonight. Um, if anyone, uh, let's give God some praise. We made it through this. We made it.
Um, other than that, there's, um, uh, that was a lot, you guys. Um, but I'm going to make sure you get this slide and hand out on tonight. Um, anyone had any questions or comments before we close tonight? It's great teaching, and you got to be rooted and grounded in the word. And you get lost. Great teaching. Thank you so much. Wonderful lesson tonight, Minister Salsa. Praise God. Thank you so much. Awesome lesson, Doctor. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. Oh, you know what I'm going to do real quick? Those of you who are still here, I got to share my screen one more time. Let me do this. Oh, I forgot about it. Um, wow. Let me do this one. Let's see how can I get to this. Um, word of the week. Oh, yeah. I'll get the word for the week real quick. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. Real briefly, real quick. Um, this is on a website called Pittsburgh Cemeteries. And this is him here. And I just want to give you a glimpse of the burial site where he's buried. So this is um, the tombstone. Um, then the Laodicean messenger. Interesting, um, because we know the church of Laodicea was the church in the book of Revelation chapter three, that right. God said he wanted to spit them out like vomit. So I wow. wouldn't even know why would I want to be associated with the Laodicean messenger? Because uh -huh. this is the church that said that they had everything and didn't need Jesus. Uh -huh. And um, this is his actual big tombstone. It's a big pyramid there. If you guys see that, I just wanted to show you that real briefly. Okay. And then um, here's something else. Just want to show you this real brief and quick. Um, those are more much bigger picture. So this is his actual tomb or burial site. And we have to always be mindful that you can go over to our founder and his tomb is empty in Israel, Jerusalem, okay? So this is what I want people to understand that these are movements and this is where he was buried, okay? So I just wanted to show you that real quick. And um, we have a couple of quick little announcements real quick. Um, as you know, um, on May 28th, um, we will have a special service at One Way Assembly. And as you know, um, yours truly, Bishop Rodney Andrews from the Comeback Christian Community uh, will be um, coming to share a word with us and instructions regarding uh, the new move into the new building. So we will have some information on that. So if you're not busy, on May 28th, which is the fourth Sunday in May, come on through so you can get a blessed word and we will receive some good instructions. Amen. So we are so thankful to have his presence grace us again. And to God be the glory. Um, man, there's so much um, goodness of things that are so, uh, I'm always so excited to um, share God's word always with each and every one of you, because without you, I definitely cannot get any of this done. So with that said, um, who are we um, trying to get everything ready? Um, let me get this uh, word for the week for you real quick. I just had it. Where did it go? Let's see. Well, let me give you one right off the dome. <laughs> Your life will always be easier when people have their own business to attend to and not yours. So we have to always be mindful that your life will always be easier when people find some business to get into and stay out of yours because people are so busy these days, they have to realize that I'm busy. So how are you busy trying to be figure out what I'm doing? And I'm quite sure y'all got people all over the town trying to figure you out, doing this and that. That's why Jesus cut it short and said he told his mom and stepfather and stepmother, I must be about my father's business. For one, y'all forgot me. Y'all was gone three days out and had to come back and pick me up. 
So we have to always realize that we must be about our father's business, which is Jesus' business, and quit being so busy in other people's business. Amen. Amen. So to God be the glory, I'm going to give us a word of prayer. Um, oh, I see some on question, um, um, questions on in Facebook. Yeah, Tierra, I'm going to catch up with you to get your email address so I can send this to you. So I got you covered. So it's good to see those on Facebook with us. Um, look, Tierra, Marty Slocum, Serena, it's good to see you guys. And we have a blessed, um, man, we had a blessed time tonight. And it's good to see all of you hanging in there with us tonight on Zoom with us. Man, we made it. So to God be the glory. Um, let us have a word of prayer. All Amen. Eyes closed, all heads bowed. Dear Father God, we thank you so much what our eyes have seen and what our ears have heard on tonight. Lord, there's so much information and we need to make sure we have the right information so we can share the information of your son, Jesus Christ. So those who don't know you in the pardon of their sins, Father, they may come to the newness, come to the light and come to accept you as their personal and say, because you are coming back. But the thing is, when you come back, you asked, will you find faith? And you did say, I'm coming back for a church yes. without a spot or a wrinkle, meaning he's not coming back for any denomination. He's not coming back for the Baptist. He's not coming back for the Presbyterian. He's not coming back for any movement. He's trying to find people walking by faith and not by sight. And he's always also trying to find people who want to receive the free gifts of salvation. It's yeah. free. You don't have to work at this. It's free. And then we must be born again, Father. We must believe that you sent your son, died, placed in a borrowed tomb, stayed there all day Friday and Saturday, and he rose from the dead with all power and glory in heaven and earth on the third day for our justification. And Father, we thank you for every Zoom listener, viewer, and call. We thank you for those who are with us on social media. And Father, these are just the things that are not from me, but it's the truth, and you can go find the truth. The problem is we don't want to know it, so we have to go search the truth and find it, Father. And we thank you for this moment, and I ask all these blessings in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. To God be the glory. It's good to see all of you, and Lord's will, tomorrow we will be dealing with our lesson, dealing with fasting. Hopefully many of you have been blessed. Hope you may have started a small fast. Don't go in, head in for already. Just make sure you can go. And when you do it, God is going to bless you and change your life. To God be the glory. Love you all. Um, uh, have a blessed night. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen.